in the chat uh, box or you can post it on the the uh, on this the Slack message and I will post your question. I'll ask the presenter for your uh, for your question. Okay. So Apana, can you put the first presentation? on the share video. And our first presentation is the, from the Lanyang Technological University. So this is a joint work between the Lanyang Techno uh, Technological University and the University of Auckland, and also for, from the RMIT University from Australia. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to present our research work, Online Anomalous Trajectory Detection with Deep Generative Sequence Modeling. I'm Edin from Nanyang Technological University, and this is a joint work with Kai Chi from University of Auckland and Zhifeng from RMIT University. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I will briefly introduce the background and the research problem. Second, I will elaborate our proposed method, which consists of two parts, trajectory modeling and detection. Then. I will present the experimental results and finally conclude our work. With the proliferation of GPS devices and ride hailing services, such as Uber and Lyft, a huge amount of trajectories are being generated. These trajectories are usually represented as sequences of sample GPS points, which can be used to characterize the mobility of moving objects. As trajectory data is of great use in real-world applications, the detection of anomalous trajectory has become a critical concern. In particular, we define anomalous trajectories as those do not follow normal rules between the given source and destination. Such detection has a wide range of applications, such as preventing taxi frauds, where some taxi drivers may take unnecessary detour to overcharge the passengers. Another application is to sense unusual event in the transportation system, such as road construction and car accident. We next show two examples to demonstrate the applications. In the first example, we, assu we assume that R1 and R2 are two normal routes that are frequently traveled between S1 and D1. Therefore, T1 is an anomalous trajectory as it does not follow R1 or R2. In the second example, R3 and R4 are two normal rules between S2 and D2. We consider T2 is anomalous in this case. Note that even though the segments of T2 lies on R3 and R4, but it does not follow R3 or R4 completely. So this might indicate there is an unusual event in R3 prime. We name these two cases as detour anomaly and route switching anomaly. For solving this problem, there are mainly two challenges. The first one is to discover normal routes from high, highly complex trajectory data. This is challenging because the transportation system itself is very complicated. Meanwhile, we need to capture the sequential correlation behind trajectory. The second challenge is to support efficient online detection. Here, the online detection means to detect a trajectory while it is being sequentially generated. There are some previous studies for this problem. Most of them are based on a two-step framework. They first select some representative trajectories as normal routes and compare a target trajectory with the representatives using distance or density matrix. However, they cannot properly tackle the two challenges. Firstly, they require a lot of heuristics and cannot handle the complexity behind the data. Also, many of them miss to consist, consider the sequential correlations and thus cannot detect root switching anomalies. In addition, the computation using this distance and uh, density matrix is not very efficient. 
To this end, we contribute a novel solution for anomalous trajectory detection. First, we discover normal routes by modeling trajectory with deep generative model. The model represents underlying roots of trajectories as latent vectors and applies Gaussian mixture model to model their probability distribution, where the probability can be used to define normal roots. Compared with previous work, our model discovers normal roots in a data-driven manner, and it thus is very flexible. Secondly, based on the normal roots, we propose novel detection framework, which detects anomalies via trajectory generation. This is much more efficient than most existing studies. Next, I will elaborate these two parts. The intuition behind the first part, trajectory modeling, is that the routes traveled by trajectories can be represented as latent vectors. And latent routes can be inferred from trajectories. And trajectories can be generated from latent routes. Based on these three intuitions, we propose a Gaussian mixture variational sequence order encoder, where three components are jointly trained, the inference network, the latent root distribution, and the generative network. More specifically, the inference network is learned to infer the latent roots of a given trajectory. The latent root distribution is learned to model the probability of a route traveled by trajectories. And the generative network is learned to generate a trajectory from its latent root. By training this autoencoder using massive trajectory data, we are able to get a probability distribution of latent routes, where the probability represents how likely the route would be traveled. Here we use Gaussian mixture distribution as an implementation. It is very flexible to model complex data. The probability of each Gaussian component C is defined as PR given C. We can also interpret that the different Gaussian components can be considered as different type of roots. Next, we are going to leverage the probability distribution of roots and the generative network to formulate the detection framework. In particular, we first define normal roots as those with high probability to be traveled. Intuitively, for each type of roots, the mean vector in the Gaussian component has the highest probability and thus we define all the mean vectors. We use all the mean vectors as the normal rules for the detection. Then based on the normal rules, we can define anomalous trajectories as those with low probability to be generated from normal rules. To achieve this, we utilize the generative model to derive the anomaly scores as one minus the highest generation probability using all the normal rules. We show the overall workflow of the detection framework, where we draw the normal rules from the learned distribution and use them to detect a given trajectory using the generative network. As the generative network is actually a recurrent neural network, the time complexity is OC times N where n is the number of GPS points in the trajectory, and c is the number of Gaussian components, which is uh, constant. However, we know that the constant c might affect the efficiency. This is because there are totally c types, types of normal roots, and we don't know which one of the, which one of the normal roots that the trajectory actually, actually follow so that we need to make C trials of the generation. To further improve the efficiency, we propose to infer the real normal route of a given trajectory beforehand. To achieve this, we leverage the source and destination of the given trajectory. The intuition is that the trajectory is traveled between the same types of source and destination usually belong to the same type of route. And thus we can infer its normal route 
using the source and destination. In particular, we introduce an SD network, which is implemented as a multi-layer perceptron that takes the source and destination of a trajectory as input and outputs the selection of one normal route for the trajectory detection. Therefore, the detection method is C times faster than the previous one. We conduct ex experiments on two public datasets, Porto and Beijing. Porto contains over 260,000 trajectories, and Beijing contains over 52,000 trajectories. To evaluate the models, we inject two types of anomalies in each dataset as ground truths. The first one is detour anomalies, where we randomly select a trajectory from data and shift a part of it. Here, T2 is considered as an anomaly. The second one is rule switching anomalies, where we select and switch two trajectories. Here, T5 is uh, considered as an anomaly in this case. In the experiments, we compare our methods with six baselines. For each data set, we inject 5% of anomalies and report the precision recall AUC values of all the methods. The results on Porter data show that our proposed methods are significantly better than the baselines. Similarly, our methods are able to outperform baselines in, on Beijing data. We also find out that our method is very efficient among all the methods, and it is scalable for online detection. We can also see from case study that the detection results are pretty reasonable. Also, we visualize the trajectories following different types of routes, and we find out that they are quite different from each other. In conclusion, we propose a novel solution for anomalous trajectory detection in this paper. The solution is equipped with an effective trajectory modeling method that can model the probability distribution of latent routes. Based on the trajectory modeling, we are able to develop efficient detection method via trajectory generation. Experiments show that the solution can achieve high effectiveness and efficiency at the same time. Thank you very much for listening, and now I would like to take questions from you. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Yiding. So the first question that uh, from, from Lisi Chen and uh, asking about uh, the um, in page 13, what did you see? You need to unmute it yourself. Uh, do we have the presenter here? Okay, I think that the presenter is not here. Okay, so then we will uh, go to the next paper. So next paper is the from the Central University, uh, mobility aware the dynamic taxi uh, ride sharing, and then the Professor Li that the graduate from Zhejiang University and uh, now joined the Central University as an assistant professor. So Pana, you can you uh, show the, the presentation? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Zi Daniel from Central University. Today, I'm very glad to present our paper, Mobility Aware Dynamic Text Ride Sharing. Ride Sharing is quite popular in recent years. It allows multiple passengers with the similar itineraries and the scheduled to share a vehicle. And it actually brings many benefits to the city. So it has become popular worldwide. In addition to the private vehicle-based ride sharing, tax ride sharing becomes promising and uh, attracts a lot of research efforts. This is because tax is an important transportation mode in all cities. 
texts are widely available in a city and they are operating days and nights. In addition, texts can be either booked online or held along the street. To model a text registering system, we assume many requests and texts are running on a load network graph, G. Each request includes the information such as origin, destination, release time, and the, the delivery deadline. The text state also includes the information such as current location, text schedule, and the travel route. Text schedule is a sequence of oranges and a destination of the short requests. And this figure shows an uh, example text schedule. In fact, text registering is quite dynamic and uh, challenging because the requests are generated on the fly and the text schedules are continuous updated. So there are some works proposed solutions for the text registering and uh, they process a rare request mainly in two stages. In the stage one, based on the orange of a request, they will decide the candidate text for some this request. For example, for the online request R1, they will return text T1 and T2 to serve R1. And in the second stage, they will investigate the schedules of each candidate text and uh, then select the one with the minimum introduced digital cost. However, we observe at least two limitations of existing solutions. First, they have an inefficient passenger text matching based on partial mobility information of taxis and uh, requests. For example, in this example, in this example, we found Text T2 travels inversely with request R1, and it should never be included into the candidate text set. Instead, we found that text T3 is better than T1 and T2. Secondly, they omit the offline passages. In this example, the offline Requests are true, we are never be served by the existing solutions because the request is not linked online. However, according to a recent report, more than 50% users may have a text along the street in an offline manner. So it is necessary to build a tax registration system that can serve both online and offline passages. In this paper, he concerns a novel problem called mobility aware text registering problem. Given the node level G, a set of taxes T, and a set of requests R, including online requests and the offline requests to predict, we would like to properly schedule taxes to serve these requests so as to maximize the number of served requests and minimize the total digital costs. The schedules should meet the following two constraints, the capacity of each taxi and the delivery deadline of each request. To address the MTR problem, we present MT share. And this figure shows the framework of our system. It mainly includes two models, text request indexing and the passenger text matching. I will introduce each part with more details next. First, we also partition the node map. Instead, instead of the same grades, we use the bipartite map partition, and it runs as follows. First, at the very beginning, we run the kinase casting on the graph vertex to derive k special clusters, and then we repeat, repeat the following three steps. In the first step, we will calculate the transition probability between a vertex and each special cluster using the historic text data. And this figure shows an example for the transition probability calculation. Each item in the vector indicates the transition probability from vertex VI to a special cluster. Based on the 
vectors, we connect the second step, the transition cost, and then we can group the vertex into clusters according to their transition probability vectors. Then in the third step, for each transition cluster, we run again the k-means clustering on the vertex locations to derive a certain number of clusters, special clusters, based on the number of vertex in each transition cluster and the total number of vertex in the graph. We repeat the three steps until the special cluster derived in this third step do not change, and we use the cluster as the map partitions. We also propose another novel mobility casting algorithm to group requests and tags according to their travel direction. For each request, we build a mobility vector using its origin and destination. For each tag, we build its mobility vector using its current location and the average destination of the shared request in the taxi. And we use the cosine similarity and the distance metric to group or request and text into different num into different mobility clusters. And each mobility cluster will maintain a general mobility vector with the average origin and the average destination of our cluster members. So for a new coming request, it can join a mobility cluster, see if their travel direction difference is starting small. And uh, that to say this request can show the text with other requests in the cast C. We index taxes using both map partitions and the mobile cast to run aspects of the geographic location and the travel direction. So based on the indexes, we can find a better candidate text set for each request. First, according to the delivery deadline of requests, uh, we can calculate a search range and then derive the partitions SR that intersect with the search range. Then we can also get a mobility cast CA that show a similar travel direction with the request R. And the candidate text set is determined using this equation. That is to say, the candidate text are in both the mobility vertex cast CA and the partitions SR. Our text schedule will select best text to serve request R. And this algorithm shows the whole procedure. It will investigate all possible text schedules by inserting the origin and the destination of the request. And this figure shows an example of such insert, inserting OR and DR. The red lines indicate the total cost. And the, our text schedule algorithm is to find the schedule that introduces the minimum detail cost. Our system supports two routing modes. Basic routing runs in peak hours, and it will return the circuit path be between two locations, while the probabilistic routing runs in the long peak hours when texts have more idle capacity. And it will Suppose a text to meet offline requests with the highest probability. Since root planning is the bottleneck of text scrolling, so we propose a two phase optimized root planning. In the first phase, we run the partition filtering algorithm to check each partition using the following two loads. At a high level, the rules say that a partition should not differ from the direct line between the source partition and the destination partition too much from either the travel direction or the travel cost. And this figure shows that given the SZ and SZ plus one, we can fit out this partition, this green partitions at the set PZ. Based on the partition set PZ, we can build a reduced subgraph and on which we can run the second phase, segment level routing. On the second phase, basic routing actually just returns the shorted path, where the probability routing will calculate a path for a taxi that 
allow it to meet suitable constraints with the highest probability. And the, the probability routing runs through the following three steps. In the first step, we will calculate the probability of meeting suitable passengers for each partition in PZ. Here, a suitable passenger means she will travel with a similar direction with the taxi. And we can calculate the probability using historical data again. In this example, the color of each partition indicates the probability of meeting suitable passengers. The darker the higher. And based on these probabilities, we can plan a partition path that links the source partition and the destination partitions. And this path should have the maximum probability sum. And uh, so in the third step, based on the partition path PHZ, we can get another refined subgraph that is much smaller. With much small, with much few attacks and edges, and uh, we can plan the fine grained route for the tax schedule. And uh, you can find more technical details in our paper. We conduct we conduct experiments using real world tax data to evaluate our system. Our tax data are collected from Chengdu City, released by DDGAI. We build a load lab work graph from OpenStreetMap. And we make use of two hours of data to simulate the peak scenario and the non-peak scenario. In particular, in the non-peak scenario, our system will run the probability clarity to meet offline requests. We compare our system with the following schemes. And the, the MT Shear Pro is the version of our system with probability logic. And the performance metrics are as follows the number of server requests, the response term, and the detail term. Here shows the results in the peak scenario. Overall, we can find that our system responds a request within 200 milliseconds and it can serve much more requests than tissue and the peak rate DP. These figures show the results in the non peak scenario. Again, our system performs better than the three, can, that three competitors with a middle response term. Because of the probability loading, our system can serve much more offline requests than the competitors. We also study the impacts of some parameter settings, for example, the partition number and the tax capacity. We found that too small or oversized partition number will affect the performance. This is because the number of partitions will affect the candidate tax steps, so it will affect the right showing performance. From the right figure, we found that our system benefits more from a larger tax capacity. To conclude, in this paper, we consider a lower mobility aware tax ratio problem that aims to serve both online and the offline red requests. And we propose a lower scheme named MT share by fully exploiting the mobility information of taxis and the requests. And we performed experiment on real world tax data and the ratio that our system outperformed the state of art methods. Thank you for your listening. Okay, yeah, thank you, Sudan. Any question from the from the audience? No, then I, I have the two questions. So first question that the, you mentioned about the, the index. Do you also use any of the spatial indexing in when you uh, when you do the uh, the taxi on the map? You want to unmute yourself? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Actually, we index all text and the request using 
the map partition and the, the what yeah, uh, My question is, do you any the using the spatial indexing methods like R three, R plus three, R star three? Okay, no. In our current implementation, we do not use the, the other indexing technique, and we I, I, and I think this technique can be used in our system so that the, the performance can be further improved. Yeah, I think that you're, you're right. I think that I'm just just thinking about maybe you use the indexing spatial index method, the performance can be further improved. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and another one when you say about the the, the performance, did do you also evaluate the the what did the 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 customers the waiting time? Is also one part of the evaluation performance? Uh, yes, there are some results in our paper, but uh, I didn't include in our slides. Okay. And very yeah, the right the waiting time is uh, comparable with the other methods. It's about uh, one or two minutes. Yeah, similar as other methods. No, no, then 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 that's the response time. I'm just saying that the taxi drivers, the from taxi driver when they when from they call and they would taxi drive arrive. Uh, and no, the waiting time of the passengers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also consider right. Yes, in okay. the paper. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. Okay. So we'll go. Go to the next presentation. So next presentation will be an intriguing topic it's called the uh, online trichromatic pickup and uh, delivery scheduling in spatial crowdsourcing. So there's the joint work from multiple university, from the Huazhong University, uh, Huazhong University of Science and Technology, Suni Xian University, and uh, Alberg University, Griffith University and then also University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Okay, so Pana, you want to show the presentation? Pana, do you have the slide? I think that we're waiting for the the the, the student helper to put down the 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 video file. Then in the meantime, I want to check if the presenter here, the Bolong Zhen. Okay, I think that the presenter is not here. So we will we'll be waiting for the video to be uploaded. Let me check with the opponent, okay, the host. Okay, yeah, thank you, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Mr. Daniel from Central University. Oh, yeah, Apana, you didn't upload the right file. That's for the 155. Online trichromatic pickup. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bo Longjin from Huazhong University of Science Technology. And today I'm going to present my work online, trichromatic pickup and delivery scheduling in spatial crowdsourcing. And first, this is outline of my presentation today, which includes introduction, preliminaries, framework, experiments, and conclusion. And notice we have many different spatial crowdsourcing platforms. And uh, in the spatial crowdsourcing platforms, we have different kinds of tasks, such as the transportation tasks, and we have Didi and Uber. And for product checking tasks, we have GigaWork. For online food ordering and delivery services, we have Uber Eats, Meituan, Elama. So on these uh, spatial crowdsourcing platforms, the online crowd workers are assign tasks through their smartphones and they can accomplish these uh, tasks and get rewards. And now um, we have many more new requirements and challenges in the special crowdsourcing applications. For example, in the existing 
um, scenarios, we have only one pickup locations, but it is possible that we have more than one uh, pickup locations for a specific item. And in addition, the customer's decision may be affected by different aspects. For example, the rating of the restaurant, the price of the food provided, and how reliable is the delivery man and the price and the time waited. So to overcome these challenges and problems, we in this paper, we study a um, problem called online trichromatic pickup and delivery scheduling. And we are given a set of available workers. We have a set of pickup point of interest, uh, interest and uh, orders and tasks submitted by the customers. The OTPD problem is proposed, which aims to assign the tasks to workers with the goal of maximizing the overall utility, subject to some constraints. The utility is defined as follows. It's a linear combination of three aspects. Um, the workers has a score, the POI has a score, and the task also has a score. So we kind of uh, incorporate these three scores together using an linear function. And the goal is to maximize the overall utility. And here is a running example. We um, in Figure A we have um, we should, we indicate the the location of the workers and the uh, point of interest and customers. And in Figure B we have in, in, information for the tasks point of interest and the workers. And the Figure C shows um, the time order task schedule for each workers. So for preliminary, first we define. Um, concept called a trichromatic match is a triple and it's a worker item task triple. And for each worker, we assign a task schedule for him because he may have more than one task at the same time. So we have to give a schedule for him. And second, we need to uh, evaluate if a schedule is valid. So we have several different constraints like the task acceptance constraint, the pickup selection constraint. These two constraints are associated with a radius around the worker and the task. And the travel order, the, this is obvious because the pickup must happen before the delivery and task capacity. Uh, each worker has a um, capacity limit and expiration time means uh, the item must be delivered to its destination before some specific uh, time. And for the program definition, we aim to find an assignment for each task and build a delivery schedule for each worker with small cost, such, such that the overall utility is maximized. So for the framework, we, um, we use two index structures in in LTPD problem. One is the IR3, IR2 tree index. It is used to, it's built on the pickup point of interest. It is to return the candidate pickup POIs. And the grid index is used to store the up-to-date location of each worker. It returns all the candidate workers. And for the system overview, we have uh, three components, important components. First is, to identify candidate workers and pick up POIs by searching these above two index structures. And the second component is to insert tasks into the schedule for a specific uh, worker. And the third part is to send the result information to users, to customers. And for scheduling, this is the core of OTPD problem. And we have, we propose three different algorithms, the Grady assignment algorithm, SKT tree, SK tree based algorithm and density based grouping algorithm, which we will introduce later. So for the grade, Grady assignment algorithm, given the new task, we obtain a set of candidate workers and a set of pickup POIs by search two index structures mentioned previous mention. And we find the valid insertion positions with the minimum incremental cost for each candidate worker. And we assign the task to the worker with the maximum utility cost, cost to reach. And uh, to insert and pick up delivery event pair, first we have to find the 
valid positions. So we propose a valid insertion, event insertion function. The second is the schedule update. So we have to update the schedule after we insert the new tasks into a, uh, for current for for a specific worker, and uh, so we propose a procedure insert event pair to insert event into position with the smallest incremental cost. The second algorithm is the SK tree based algorithm. SK tree is um is called the skylight kinetic tree, and it keeps all the intermediate computation result in the tree structure. And it captures a selected uh, uh, schedule for the worker to execute, and uh, it also store its skylines. So each route to leaf path represents a valid dynamic schedule for worker. For inserting a new tasks, we propose an algorithm called two-level best first search on SK tree, and we find the inserted position for pickup event at level one, and find the inserted position for delivery event at level two. So we call this algorithm the algorithm SKT. Input is a task tau and the set of candidate workers and set of POIs. The output is an updated schedule worker W. So we propose some pruning techniques at different levels, level one and level two, to improve the search efficiency. The last algorithm is called the density-based grouping algorithm. It divided it's a, a streaming. It processes the streaming data, streaming task data, and first it divides the task into groups and get the tasks from a short time span in batch and partition the task by core tree. And uh, all the tasks in a leaf load is a group. And for each group, we have a um, parameter n to control the maximum capacity. And second, we select a pickup point of interest. We employ a pre-selection to assign a single POI to each task. And the maximum distance between any two pickup POIs is minimized. And then we adopt the previous mentioned insertion algorithm in GA and SKT for each group to assign the tasks. So here is this experiment. First, we have two data sets. One is the real data set, G mission provided by the authors. And the second is a, a, a synthetic data set. And we have four algorithms to compare. First is an adaptive threshold AT algorithm. And the, the three algorithm we proposed, the GA, SKT, and DG. We have two evaluation metrics. One is the response time, and the other is the utility. And uh, for synthetic data and the real data, we um, vary the cardinality of the task and the worker to see the performance of the proposed algorithms. And uh, we compare them on the response time and duty value. We can see in all these algorithms, not so surprisingly, the SKT algorithm has the best performance on utility value. And uh, the response time of SKT algorithm is better than the other algorithms in the synthetic data. And uh, in the real data, uh, the proposed uh, GA algorithm has the best uh, response time and the utility value is the highest utility is uh, by SKT algorithm. And here is a performance study on DG algorithm. We can see um, we Study. We 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 conduct a self evaluation by uh, varying the value of of n and the batch length. We can see the um, response time doesn't change a lot. Utility doesn't change a lot, and uh, the response time achieved the best performance when we choose n as thirty. And if the batch length is uh, thirty seconds, we have the best performance. So that's default settings for the DG algorithm. And uh, for the conclusion, we um, the SKT algorithm outperforms both G and AT in terms of utility, but only takes slightly more time than G and AT. And DG processes the tasks in batches such that the efficiency is, is improved substantially. 
So the, for the conclusion, we formalized the uh, online trichromatic pickup and delivery scheduling problem, and we proposed three scheduling algorithms to solve the LTPD problem efficiently. And we conduct extensive experiments on real and synthetic data set, which demonstrate both the effectiveness and efficiency of our algorithm. And thank you for your listening. Okay, thanks for the video. I think that the presenter is not here in the participant. So we will go to the next paper. So next paper is the dependency aware task assignment in spatial crowdsourcing. And uh, this is a joint work between the Hong Kong University of Science Technology and the East China Normal University and also University of the New South Wales. So presented by the uh, needs, uh, Wang Zhe Ning. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Wang Zhe Ning from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. It's my honor to present our work, Task Action in Dependency Aware Spatial Crowdsourcing. First, I will introduce the motivation of this work. In real world, sometimes requesters cannot or do not want to physically move to different locations to con conduct spatial tasks by themselves. For example, one program at Imaging Recognition Project, I need many pictures of landmarks as the chaining data. I cannot travel around the world for the pictures, which is too costly. And sometimes I'm just lazy. I stay in my dorm and I want to have a hamburger why I do not want to go to McDonald's. In these cases, we want to hire some persons to help us conduct some special tasks. Recently, with the popularity of smart devices and high-speed wireless networks, a new kind of crowdsourcing systems, namely spatial crowdsourcing, became ubiquitous and attract attention from both academia and industry. Specifically, as introduced in G-Crowd, Spatial crowdsourcing is the process of crowdsourcing a set of spatial tasks to a set of workers, which requires the workers to perform the spatial tasks by physically traveling to those locations. Many exciting research have studied the crowdsourcing problem in many applications. However, we found that in some practice applications, a complex task can be a combination of multiple subtasks, and there are dependencies among subtasks. When we assign this subtask, we need to consider the dependencies. Here are two examples. For a basketball game, to make the game fair and avoid the argument, we need to hire reference. According to the official basketball game regulation, we first need to hire a proof chief. After that, we can go to hire two associated reference. And we also need to hire a scholar, a timekeeper, and a 24 second shot clock operator. Before hiring these officials, we should firstly have a shared person. And another example is holding an orientation race. We have to arrange, arrange a set of checkpoints following a specific order. Since the order of the next checkpoint should be put in the last checkpoint, the task of setting each checkpoint should be conducted following the order. Let's have a look at a simple example to have a general idea of the problem we studied. In this example, each worker is associated with the location where he or she is and a set of skills that he or she has. Each task is associated with the location where it should be conducted, a skill that that worker should have and a set of dependent tasks. The figure on the left shows the location of tasks workers and the dependent relation among tasks. For example, the task T3 is dependent on task T2 and task T1, but task T1 is independent on any task. The goal of the platform is to maximize the total number of finished tasks, whose assigned workers has, have the required skills and their dependent tasks are also assigned. The first assignment solution is assigning the closest worker who has the required skill to each task. The allocation is shown by the red arrows in the figure. Note that since T1, which is T2's dependency, has not been assigned, 
the assignment W1 and T2 is invalid. Similarly, the assignment W3 and T3 is also invalid. Thus, only one task can be conducted in this solution. However, if, if the platform takes dependencies into account, the allocation is shown by the red arrows in this figure. Each worker is assigned to a task, and the dependencies of each assigned task are satisfied. Therefore, three tasks can be conducted in this solution, which is better than the former solution. Based on the example, we want to solve a problem like this. Given a set of spatial crossing tasks and a set of moving workers, could we assign the workers to the tasks to maximize the number of the conducted tasks under the constraints of skills, deadlines, exclusion, dependencies, and distance. Next, we will show our problem formulation in details. W is a set of heterogeneous workers. A worker W located at location LW has a set of skills WSW and moves with velocity VW. Besides, the worker W only waits a certain time for an assignment. In addition, each worker claims the maximum moving distance he or she is willing to travel. And T is a set of dependency aware spatial tasks. A task T located at location LT and claims a required skill IST that the assigned worker should have to conduct it. A task T only wastes WT times for an assignment. Moreover, a task T is associated with a set of its dependent tasks which is denoted by DT. Based on the definition of workers and tasks, we show the definition of our dependency aware spatial crowdsourcing problem. The DASC problem has five constraints. The first is the deadline constraint, which requires that all the workers can arrive at the assigned task before their deadlines. The second constraint is the skill constraint. That is, workers only can conduct the task whose required skills they have. The third is the exclusion constraint. Each task is assigned to at most one worker, and each worker is assigned to at most one task. The fourth is the dependency constraint. Each task is assigned only if its dependent tasks are all assigned. The fifth is the distance constraint. Each worker cannot travel more than his or her maximum moving distance. Given a set of heterogeneous workers and a set of dependency-aware tasks, the DSC problem aims to find an assignment which satisfies the five constraints and maximizes the number of assigned tasks. However, we prove the DSC problem is NP-hard by reducing it from the subset sum optimization problem. Next, we introduce the algorithms we propose to solve the DSC problem. To solve the DSC problem, we propose a DSC greedy approach and a game theoretic approach. The DSC greedy approach contains two stages. In the first stage, the algorithm grooms each unassigned task with its unassigned dependent task as an associated task set. For example, since T3 is dependent on T1 and T2, the corresponding associated task set, TC3, contains T1, T2, and T3. But since T1 is independent on any task, its corresponding associated task set, TC1, only contains itself. Then in the second stage, for each associated task set, the approach finds a maximum matching between unassigned worker set and the associated task set. Among all maximum matching of associated task sets, the one with maximum assigned task is assigned. For example, here the maximum matching between worker set and the associated task set TC1 only contains one assigned task. But the maximum matching between worker set and the associated task set TC3 contains three assigned task, tasks. Therefore, in this round, the maximum matching between worker set and the associated task set TC3 is selected to be assigned. The approach iteratively runs these two stages until there is no task can be assigned. In our example, since the maximum matching between worker set and the associated task set TC3 is assigned, the left unassigned worker set is W3 and W5. 
Since task T4's dependent task T2 has been assigned, the updated associated task set TC4 only contains T4. And the right figure shows the maximum matching between the unassigned worker set and the updated associated task set TC4. We prove the result of DSC greedy approach is bounded by one minus one over all the number. The game theoretic approach constructs a static game for a given DSC problem instance. Specifically, the approach treats each worker as a prayer. Each prayer's static set is the set of tasks that he or she can conduct. In addition, each prayer tries to maximize his or her own utility by selecting his or her best strategy. Specifically, the approach has two states. In the first stage, the approach generates an initial assignment for workers. For example, here, worker W1 is designed to conduct T3. W2, W3, and W4 are all designed to conduct T2, and the W5 is designed to conduct T4. Then in the second stage, each worker select his or her best task in turns until there is no worker wants to change his or her assigned task. We return the coverage results as the corresponding assignment. For example, since T3's dependent task T1 is assigned to any worker, is not assigned to any worker, the best strategy for W1 is to conduct task T1. Thus, W1 changed his or her strategy to conduct T1. Since W2 and W3 can only conduct T2, they keep their strategies. And since T2 is designed to two workers, while T3 is not assigned to any worker, the best strategy of W4 is to conduct T3. Similarly, W5 keep his or her strategy. We make some analysis of the game threat approach. Firstly, we prove the strategic game that we constructed is a potential game. Then we prove the best response loop can coverage within polynomial time. Finally, we prove the result can be bounded. The POS of a game is the ratio between the best value among its equilibrium and the global optimal variance. The POA of a game is the ratio between the worst value among its equilibrium and the global optimum. To evaluate our approach's performance, we did some experiments. We used both real and the synthetic data sets to test our proposed approaches. Specifically, for real data, we use meetup data set in Hong Kong area, which was crewed between October 2011 and January 2012. There are more than 3,500 workers and more than 1,200 tasks. And to extend the effects of the size of the skill universe, the number of workers, the number of skill tasks, the size of each task dependency set, and the size of each worker's skill set, we generate the synthetic data set and run the experiment on it. Our experimental settings is shown in the table. Since the DSC problem is NP-hard, it is infeasible to calculate the optimal result as a ground truth in large-scale datasets. Alternatively, we compare our approaches with two baseline methods, closest and random, as well as an existing algorithm, G divide and conquer, which is, pro which is proposed in a related paper. The G divide and conquer algorithm keeps dividing the algorithm into G sub problems on each level. Until finally, the number of tasks in each sub problem is one, which can be solved by the greedy algorithm on each one task sub problem. Note that for the game strategic approach, if we strictly set the termination condition and there is no worker change his strategy in the last iteration, the coverage speed is very slow. In practice, we usually set a threshold of the utility updating ratio instead. In other words, if the utility updating ratio in a round is lower than the threshold, we terminate the iteration. Although with the increase of the threshold, the running time of the game threat approach will decrease, the scope of it will decrease too. Thus, we have to select a proper threshold to check off the scope and the running time. We run an experiment with different termination conditions. We vary the value of the threshold from zero, which means there is no worker change his strategy in the last iteration to 10%. As shown in the left figure, when the threshold is larger than 5%, the score decreased sharply, and the right figure is just that 
with the increase of the threshold, the running time decreases. Therefore, to check off the score and the running time, we set the threshold at 5% in our experiments. In this quick result, we can see that when the moving speed of worker increases, the number of assigned tasks increases. The reason is that the number of valid worker and task pair increase, and some better assignments can be found by the approaches. However, the increasing number of worker and task pairs also increase the workload of our approaches. In addition, we noticed that our DSC approaches have significant improvements compared to the three baseline actions. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, the sponsor. Okay. So we have the any question from the participant? Okay. So then I have the I have one question. So you for your test, if the test has the different priorities, can your framework can also be doing that? High priority, low priority, and then all based on the, the requirement. Oh, sorry. Can can you, uh, can you uh, repeat your question? Yeah. So right now all the tests have the same priority, right? So they treat it equally. So yeah. if some tests have higher priorities, or the high emergencies, do you think that your framework can do can also have the based uh, on so the of the how, how you define the priority? Yeah. So for example, some some tests have the specific limited time need to be conducted, need to be finished. No, uh, our 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 problem uh, targets the 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 scenario where some tasks uh, is dependent on another task. We did not uh, uh, consider the problem of urgent cases. Yeah. Yeah. So they just just based on the order, right? Without any the uh, priority concern, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, but it's a good question. I think maybe we can do in our future. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we have the uh, our the last uh, presentation for the uh, parallel semantic trajectory similarity join. So that's the joint work from multiple university, Hong Kong Baptist University and uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University and the Albert University and the Kin Abdullah University of Science and the Technology. So will be presented by the Li Si Chen. So Pana, can you upload the, the video file? Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Li Si Chen. I'm very happy to present our research project parallel semantic trajectory similarity join. Let me outline my talk today. At the beginning, I'd like to present our problem statement followed with the baseline solutions. Next, I'm going to uh, talk about our proposed method and finally conclude with our experimental results. Firstly, let me introduce what is the semantic trajectory. The semantic trajectory can be defined as the finite sequence of the geotextual objects. Where the geotextual object consists of the two parts of information, a point-based location and a set of the terms or the text descriptions. We focus on the problem of the semantic trajectory similarity joint, which is the abbreviated STS joint. Formally, given two semantic trajectory datasets, MP and Q, a similarity threshold, the theta, what we want to do is to find all trajectory pairs, the tau i and tau j, such that tau i belongs to P and tau j belongs to Q, and the similarity between the tau i and tau j exists our predefined threshold the theta. At the same time, tau i and tau j must share at least one common term regarding their geotextual object sequence. It is worth of noting that the P and Q 
can be either equal to each other or different. If the P equals to Q, uh, it is a self-joined operation. Otherwise, they are non-self-joined. Notice that our proposal can handle both self-joined and non-self-joined. This is our spatial texture similarity measurement between the two trajectories. Here, the similarities of the all pairs of the uh, geotextual object in each trajectory are taken into consideration. We proceed to have a look at the baseline algorithm to solve the semantic trajectory similarity joint problems. The high-level idea is to apply an inverted file followed with an exhaustive search. The left-hand side denotes and toy examples with the semantic trajectories and location information and the text description of the geotextual objects involved in the semantic trajectories. The based on the toy dataset, we construct a trajectory inverted file. It is more or less similar to the, the common inverted file for the documents. In particular, for each terms, we, man, we maintain a list that index the, the all of the semantic trajectory whose geotextual object contains at least one the particular term. Based on the trajectory inverted file, we conduct an exhaustive search. Specifically, for each trajectory tau, we evaluate the all pairs of the tau and tau i such that the tau i shares the common terms with tau. This is the time complexity of the baseline method. Uh, specifically, uh, to compute the similarity, the spatial textual similarity between the two trajectories, uh, the complexity is the number of the object in each trajectory multiplied by the square of the number of the terms per object. As a result, the, the overall time complexity of evaluating all pairs of the trajectories uh, is the number of the terms per object multiplied by the power of the number of the object in each trajectory multiplied by the power of the number of the trajectory in the data set. To make the summarization of the baselines, it has two limitations. The firstly, it suffers from the high cost of the computing the similarity between the two trajectories. Secondly, each trajectory pair is evaluated separately, which is very time consuming given a large number of the semantic trajectories. To solve these two problems, we need to propose the trajectory pair pruning strategy to prune unqualified trajectory pairs without the need of the calculating the similarity between each object pair. Another thing we need to do is to develop the parallelized batch processing algorithm that is able to evaluate a group of the trajectory pairs simultaneously so as to uh, reduce uh, the time cost. This is the high-level idea of our two-phase parallel matching mechanism. Given a collection of the semantic trajectories, uh, the first thing we need to do is to summarize the spatial information and the textual information of each trajectory in the data set. And after that, based on the summarizations, uh, we conduct the trajectory grouping followed with the two-phase batch filtering and if it cannot be filtered, and then we are proceed with the pair evaluation to get the final result. We proceed to investigate some technical problems under this framework. The first technical problem is that given a two semantic trajectory, compute an upper bound of the uh, spatial texture similarity. We know that and the computing the exact value of the uh, spatial texture similarity is very time consuming. So we need to reduce the time complexity by uh, deriving an upper bound of such value. Uh, specifically, we have the three steps to do that. The first, uh, we index the spatial information of the semantic trajectories by the grid cells. Uh, uh, it's just like the figure in the bottom. And we can see that uh, we uh, the locations of the 
uh, each trajectory uh, in the figure are organized by the grid, grid cells and, and aggregate by the grid. And secondly, we need to index the textual information of the trajectories by the textual summary. Okay, so and this is the textual summary of the trajectory tau one. Okay, and in the uh, bottom left is the textual summary of the trajectory tau two. So we just aggregate the all of the textual information of the geotextual object in each trajectory. And finally, based on the indexes, we compute the spatial and textual similarity upper bounds separately. This is how do we compute the spatial similarity upper bound between the two trajectories tau 1 and tau 2. We have the three steps as a whole. The first step uh, is to index tau 1 and tau 2 by the grid cells, which is the introduced by the previous slides. And the next step is to recursively calculate the local minimal distances between the cells of the tau 1 and tau 2 in both sub areas divided by the vertical lines. In the first iteration, uh, it is denoted by the red vertical lines lies in the middle of this figure. And in the next iteration, it will be the uh, orange vertical lines in each sub area divided by the red vertical line. Uh, and after that, we need to compute the local minimum distance between the cells of the tau 1 and the tau 2 in the area located the, at the most the minimum of the subjective distance away from the middle line divided in the two subspaces. Okay, in this figure, uh, it is the denoted by the shallow red areas in the middle of them. And this is the time complexity of our computation of the spatial similarity upper bound. And we can see that uh, this time com uh, this complexity is, uh, is much better than uh, the complexity of the baseline. Let's move on to have a look at how do we get the textual similarity upper bound regarding the ST, tau 1 and tau 2. Okay. Actually, uh, the um, computation of the textual upper bound between the tau 1 and the tau 2 uh, is quite straightforward. That is, we just need to get the uh, information from the textual summaries of the tau 1 and the tau 2 respectively, and then we can get the upper bound of the uh, textual relevance between the each textual information in the geotextual object and the whole uh, and the whole semantic trajectories. In the previous slides, we introduced how do we um, optimize the computation of the uh, similarity between the two individual trajectories. Okay, now what we want to do is to group the similar trajectories to enable the batch filtering that to filter out the unnecessary trajectory pairs or unqualified trajectory pairs. As we know, the trajectory uh, are firstly indexed by the trajectory inverted file. However, the number of the semantic trajectories can be very large, making it very time consuming to evaluate each trajectory pairs individually. The trajectory in each inverted list are grouped into the batches based on their spatial information. Here, um, we have the batch MBR. MBR denotes the minimum bounding rectangles, which is the cluster of the trajectories in the particular inverted list. And we also have the batch text summary that summarizes the term of the trajectories in each batch. The phase one is the interlist batch filtering. That is to evaluate each pair of the batches in an inverted list and check if each batch pairs requires the further evaluation. In this step, the each inverted list can be evaluated in parallel because we do not need to communicate with the result in the other threads. The phase two is the trajectory batch filtering. Specifically, if a batch pair cannot be filtered, we proceed to evaluate each trajectory against each batch and check if any trajectory in the batch is similar to the previous trajectory. If a trajectory batch pair cannot be pruned, we need to further evaluate each trajectory pair individually. Finally, let's have a look at the summary of the experiments. Here we use the two datasets. 
The first data set is the New York trajectory data annotated with the New York PUIs. The second data set is the Beijing taxi trajectory data annotated with the geotech tweets from Beijing. And we evaluate the three methods in our experiments. The first method is an exhaustive search with the trajectory inverted file. And the second one um, is the trajectory inverted file uh, optimized with the semantic trajectory summarizations and the trajectory pair pruning mechanisms. And the third one, the BF join, uh, is the STM uh, further optimized with the trajectory grouping and the batch filtering mechanism. Uh, let's have a look at the summary of our result. We can find that our proposed method, the BF join, performs appro approximately an order of the magnitude faster than uh, the exhaustive search. Uh, and it also performs the two times the faster in comparison to the algorithm without the batch filtering which demonstrating the effectiveness of the intralist batch filtering and the trajectory search filtering. And thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lissy. That, uh, any question from the audience? Okay. Yeah, so I think that the, uh, the one question from the uh, superior array is the, the question is the how to determine the, the trajectory. How do you decide the trajectory from your data set? Uh, hello, hello. The, side, the, side, the trajectory page side, the size of the uh, trajectory, the batch. Uh, you mean the uh, the batch size, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, the batch the batch of the trajectory is determined based on the clustering algorithm. That is to gather the uh, spatially similar trajectory, which means that the trajectory that had a similar uh, uh, that had a similar location sequence and group them together from the batch. And we have the detailed uh, clustering algorithm. It is a uh, it is a based on the clustering algorithm or the threshold based online clustering algorithm to cluster the trajectory. So the size of the batch is determined by uh, uh, parameters, the parameters that measure the similarities threshold. Yeah, there's a, sim there's a parameter that determines the batch size. And the batch size is not, itself is not a parameter, but we have another parameter, which is the similarity threshold that will determine, that will have the influence on the batch size. Yeah. And that, can you, uh, you want to elaborate it, uh, something about uh, uh, some a specific application of this, uh, of your technique? Uh, so uh, the trajectory similarity joint uh, can be used for the trajectory data cleaning. That is to clean, clean out the duplicated uh, trajectories because the trajectory data set will be very large and we, need, and we would like to uh, eliminate some of the duplicated results. And, uh, that can be recognized. Uh, because of the, uh, people post on a different tweet at the different time or the repeated. Uh, 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 it can be. Uh, for another example, is the uh, uh, is the trajectory data from the Uber or the DD, just like what the Bolong have mentioned in the uh, in, in the previous talk. Yeah, yeah. the Zheng Bolong mentioned. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in that the case, um, sometimes we need to. We just need to have some uh, have some of the different trajectories uh, in the data set to make the to maintain the quality of the data set. And in this way, and uh, we uh, in this slide, we need to eliminate some very duplicated uh, trajectories because the raw data set may have a lot of the duplicated trajectories because the uh, the travelers may frequently travel from here and there and yeah oh, and so you all would prefer some unique specifically representative the, the trajectory could be used for the following experiment. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you, Lizzie. And thank you very much. Yeah, any other question? Okay, yeah, the, then I will uh, thank for all of you to attend this uh, spatial and temporal session. And then especially, I think I would appreciate all the, the, the speakers, especially right now, some of you are in the midnight the, the time zone. Okay, so I think this uh, concludes our session. Okay, thank you.
Uh, 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 yes, excuse me. Uh, I, think I, I just found out that there's another question raised. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, did you use the Jakarta yeah, similarity? Jakarta similarity, yes. You want to express yeah. some, say something? Yeah. Yeah, uh, at, uh, at present, uh, we only use the Jakarta similarity to measure mm -hmm. the textual similarity between the two trajectory. Uh -huh. uh, but it is possible to, possible to use some other similarity, and uh, it is worth of further, further investigation, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. the other similarity measure, textual similarity measure, can also be, be, be adopted. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, okay. thank you for your question. Okay, yeah, thank you all.